Good evening, Board of Supervisors, and to the public watching at home. Um, again, very unique circumstances we're under uh, with this coronavirus upon us. Uh, it was just our last board meeting, if you recall, that we sat through and went through our proposed budget for FY21 with all the, the wishes and hopes and, and, uh, and, and economy that was pushing our budget to enable us to serve our people in ways that we currently weren't able to serve before, while also trying to be mindful of everybody along the way. Uh, in just these last two weeks, and at that point in time, if you recall, we actually did have a coronavirus update, even though that the, the virus itself was not necessarily upon us at that point in time. Uh, just in these last two weeks, though, every day, sometimes every hour, the news and information has changed. Uh, so tonight, uh, for, for you, uh, for the public, uh, we want to share with you our intel that we have, uh, in, in addition to whatever other thoughts and prayers uh, that we all can wish upon uh, our fellow citizens and businesses, quite frankly. So tonight, what we're going to have is Dr. Samuel will give a health update uh, of this particular crisis that's upon us, the pandemic. Uh, then uh, Chief Lloyd Center from the Fire Chief and, and serving in his role as the Emergency Operation uh, Center that has been virtual, if you will, since day one of the crisis that's been upon us. And then finally, Matt Harris, our Deputy County Administrator from Finance and Administration, because now this cri crisis is gone from just a health crisis and a safety crisis, quite frankly, to a financial and economic crisis that is looming, if not already descending upon us. Uh, all of the tones are sincere and, and serious. We also want you as a board to also engage in any questions or concerns or comments that you may have. Uh, and then at the end, if there's some other uh, elements so that are needed to be shared that aren't already covered otherwise, then I will do that myself. So without a further ado, uh, uh, Dr. Samuel. Thank you, Dr. Casey. Madam Chair, members of the board, um, a lot has happened, as Dr. Casey alluded to, since I last addressed you two weeks ago. Seems like the world indeed has completely changed. Uh, COVID-19 has gained a foothold here in Virginia, um, and we're seeing new cases across the Commonwealth every day. We are seeing cases here in Chesterfield County. I ended my last presentation listing steps like hand washing, covering your cough, and so forth, all of which are important measures. However, this nearly empty room is testament to the more strident measures that have been implemented since then to blunt uh, the increase in cases. Uh, these measures are aimed at what's called flattening the curve, which I thought I'd begin my presentation by talking about. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the graphic above shows that um, a, a couple of curves, which are basically epidemic curves, showing the natural progression of dis contagious disease in a population. The, the red curve shows uh, a highly infectious disease moving through a population without much protection. You notice the dotted horizontal line, which is the healthcare system capacity in any population. Uh, in, in the case of the red curve, uh, where the disease moves unabated, the healthcare system capacity is quickly overwhelmed, um, especially if there are no efforts to slow the advancement of the disease. So without any protective measures like vaccines or medications, like now, the main tool that we have at, in our arsenal are community mitigation practices like social distancing, which keep people who are sick away from those who are well, especially those who are most vulnerable to severe outcomes. So the ultimate goal is to spread the number of ill over time, which you see in the blue curve, in a manner so that the health system can accommodate them. And this is flattening the curve. Next slide, please. So on the slide is a, a list of community mitigation strategies, most of which follow the concept of social distancing. I won't read through all of them. You will note that we have pretty much implemented all of them by this time, many of which have uh, taken place over the past few weeks. You know better than I the social and economic impacts of doing these. Um, however, the ultimate goal, of course, I think we all agree, is to protect those who are most vulnerable. Next slide, please. Just wanted to give you an update in terms of the numbers of morbidity. Those are individuals who are ill as well as mortality that we're seeing across the world, uh, in the states, uh, locally in the Commonwealth, as, we are, as well as here in Chesterfield County. This data is, was updated this afternoon comes from a variety of sources. Um, you'll notice that the worldwide total is almost half a million individuals who are sick with the disease cases. 
uh, deaths that I believe just passed the 20,000 uh, 20, individual mark here in the United States, uh, close to 55,000 cases with uh, 700 plus deaths. Uh, when I was here two weeks ago, the number of cases in the United States hadn't hit the 1,000 individual mark, about 30 deaths at that time. Here in the Commonwealth, 391 cases as of uh, this morning with nine deaths. Chesterfield County, we do have officially 11 cases. First case, just in terms of time frame, uh, recorded in Virginia was March the 8th. The first positive test in Chesterfield County was March the 11th, two weeks ago. Next slide, please. I also wanted to offer you just a, a timeline, a very simple graphic depicting a snapshot, essentially, of cases that we have seen over time, uh, just to give you a sense of their uh, proximity as well as uh, the, the number uh, of increase that we have seen. Uh, this information comes from yesterday, uh, updated yesterday, so it doesn't include uh, the one additional case that, that we have today for a total of 11. You will notice that typically they're appearing one at a time in, in a steady increase. Essentially what we're seeing as we conduct investigations of each of these cases is community transmission, which essentially means that we're not able to connect cases to some ultimate or fundamental or connected source. Um, so we really don't know how individuals are getting these cases, uh, getting sick apart from coming in contact with individuals who are positive that we don't know about. Hence the movement to more uh, stringent social distancing practices. Next slide, please. Wanted to give you an update on the testing situation, which has been one of the greatest challenges in responding to this issue. Um, the need to identify positive cases is essential to public health practice in um, uh, pandemic response because that allows us to quarantine individuals who are positive to abate the, the spread of these diseases like this. Without that, we're more or less chasing our tails. Um, however, uh, by way of an update, we testing capacity is slowly improving. It's certainly not where we want it to be. Public institutions like um, university hospitals now are gaining capacity to do the testing locally. Private labs are as well, including LabQuest, uh, pardon me, LabCorp and Quest. However, they are severely backlogged um, several days before you get results back from tests that are submitted. Um, more physician practices are doing testing, which is a, a positive sign. Um, the biggest issue, however, are the limitations, severe limitations in testing supplies, both in terms of the reagents, as well as simple things like the swabs to, to uh, collect samples with. Next slide, please. Um, so despite these challenges, one of the most encouraging things that I've encountered is a regional approach to tackling this issue. I had mentioned this kind of getting underway the last time we spoke. So there are a number of localities in the central part of the state that are coordinating resources to address this epidemic together, creating a unified, consistent response addressing all the things listed there in terms of improving testing capacity regionally. A um, couple of ways by which that is happening. Again, that is one of the most uh, urgent issues to, to address. Um, through finding ways to increasing capacity by bringing more private providers on board to collect samples, to finding more places that will run the test. These are ongoing things that are happening. Uh, another way is by finding ways to test those who uh, most need to be tested. So for example, last week there were two point of testing sites that were opened, uh, basically drive-through testing opportunities, one in Henrico County and one here in Chesterfield County. We're still awaiting lab results. I mentioned that uh, lab backlog is part of the issue. Um, information flow and response activities uh, are ongoing and again, uh, one of the, the great things that this regional approach is assisting with, which again leads to a cohesive and coordinated posture uh, coordinating support for the healthcare system is another priority issue, which is uh, attempting to address supply issues like personal protective equipment provision for private practitioners. Uh, and another important thing is to work on contingency planning uh, with local hospitals to increase bed capacity. Um, providing accurate and up-to-date public information is something this group is working on as well. And then certainly working on continuity of essential services like public safety, fire, EMS, uh, to name a few. Next slide, please. 
So I do want to stress uh, the, the absolute importance of continuing to do preventive practices. Uh, uh, listed uh, basically some of the bread and butter things that, that really need to be adhered to, which include social distancing practices, uh, encouraging individuals to remain home, um, and if you have to go out, to stay at least six feet away from others. Uh, for those who are in our most vulnerable populations to remain home, these are individuals who are 65 years old or older, those with chronic medical conditions. For individuals who are sick to stay home, please, if you are ill, and then certainly to continue those very basic uh, uh, personal protective measures, washing your hands, covering your cough, so on and so forth. Next slide, please. I, I wanna end with two slides uh, offering some additional resources to citizens and residents uh, of this county, one of which is a call center that is being operated by the Chesterfield Health District, uh, taking general questions from the public, as well as questions from providers. Uh, we're operating right now through uh, the current business hours. Uh, another opportunity is a Virginia Department of Health call center, which is available 24-7 for residents of the Commonwealth. Next slide, please. Um, as I did last time, shared these resources, which in this age of variety of inf information sources, many of which are not reliable, having steady, up-to-date, science-based information is critical at this time. Thank you very much. I'm open for any questions you might have. Madam Chair. Do any board members have any questions for Dr. Samuel? Dr. Samuel, uh, a couple of questions just from uh, citizens who have contacted me and asked certain things, and I didn't know exactly how to approach uh, those answers, but uh, I've read a number of things about the virus itself, that it could, uh, toward the end of the summer, you know, mutate and be be done. It could come back in some form uh, this fall or next winter or somewhere in between. I was wondering if you had any further information on sort of the direction that uh, that scientists and uh, health professionals like yourself uh, think this is going. Sure. Right. That's a great question. Like so many things about this particular virus, we simply don't know. Um, I think there is a lot of hope that warmer weather will reduce transmission. Again, we don't know. And we, you know, we're seeing patterns around the world where it is, where it's sustained in, in warmer climates. Um, with regard to changes in the virus, I mean, typically we see that in influenza viruses. This is a different type of virus, coronavirus. Again, I think a little bit too early to offer any definitive answers. The other question that I have been getting is, um, do of the cases in Chesterfield, do we have a pretty good idea of where they're coming from, or is it essentially under the heading of community spread at this yeah. point, and we don't know exactly where they're coming from? Right. Most of the cases would fit into that category of simply not being able to trace it to a source. Yes, so therefore community spread. Dr. Sir. Dr. Samuel. Not sure if this is even possible, but I did see several comments on it earlier. Um, is it even possible to identify where some of the positive um, results, where those people have been without identifying the person in the last two weeks? Is as that as locations where they might have, have yes. been? Um, there, there are challenges with doing that in terms of being able to protect confidentiality of both the individual as well as folks who might have been in contact with them. So. Um, one of the things that we do in public health as well as medicine is, pre is preserve privacy as much as we can. Madam Chair, Dr. Samuels, I, I just want to thank you and your staff uh, for all the hard work uh, that you're, you've been putting in. Uh, each day we've been getting um, updates uh, on uh, the different um, cases that have come into our district here. Uh, and. So I just wanted to say I appreciate, uh, on behalf of the citizens of Chesterfield County, all that you and your staff are doing, as well as all of our public safety personnel. So thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Carroll. Madam Chair, I want, uh, accordingly, I want to thank you for your, all, your hard work, all you've been doing, and with your staff, you've been doing a tremendous job. I appreciate it. I have one question. Sure. With regard to those tests that you mentioned, what is the average time for them to receive the results, roughly? Yes, very good question, sir. So there are basically two 
places where tests can go, two categories, one of which is our state lab, okay. uh, operated by the Division of Consolidated Laboratory Services. And uh, tests that go to those la that lab is facilitated through the Virginia Department of Health. There are very strict criteria that are used to send those tests. Um, the other opportunity is through private labs. If you send it through the state lab, turnaround time is quicker. Typically, right now, I think 24 to 48 hours. The big backlog is in the private lab sector. Um, the last I heard, it could be six to eight days just by virtue of the number of tests that they are processing. Thank you. Madam Chair. Mr. Carroll. Follow-up question. Um, yes. So the type of test that's being conducted now, uh, because I know that, that there were, uh, when this first started, there were several different types of tests. One was a swab that took place in the inside of the nasal cavity. The other one is now inside the throat. And one is, can actually be turned around quicker. What type of test are we providing? And are we, do we have the quicker one or the, or the slow one? Is Aside of the lab's ability to process right. the test, which one are we utilizing? Yeah, that's a very good question. And I will have to get back to you about the answer. So. Uh, what, what I do know is the actual test itself, which is basically analyzing DNA from the sample, my understanding is that has a, a fairly and finite duration. That doesn't vary based on where the sample comes from. So that you mentioned the nasal swabs, which insert a swab into the nose, uh, and the oral swab, which means going into the back of the throat. Um, my sense is, just by virtue of the type of testing procedure, um, it, probably a similar time frame. Um, I, I just don't know about whether there are any intermediate steps processing-wise that have to be added on time-wise based on the type of spot that's used and the source of, of sample. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Samuel? Thank you. Thank you on behalf of this entire board and thank you for the messaging you continue to give to our citizens. Thank, thank you. you very much. Item seven, board member reports. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Hold on. I forgot about you. Well, good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey. Um, I'd just like to start by saying that we really appreciate the support that we're getting from Dr. Samuel and the entire staff at the Chesterfield Health District office. Um, Dr. Samuel is always available to us in the event that we need uh, advice and counsel, and so we do appreciate his support. Uh, please turn on the presentation for me. Go to the first slide, please. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes this evening to brief you and our citizens on the efforts of county departments and our dedicated county employees and volunteers in response to the COVID pandemic. Next slide, please. From December through January, as the COVID virus began to spread throughout Asia, our public health, emergency management, and emergency medical services professionals were monitoring the disease and began basic preparations, including but not limited to the inventory of personal protective equipment, or PPE, and placing additional orders for supplies where needed. Drawing from lessons learned during the Ebola crisis, enhanced call screening criteria was implemented in the 911 center in late January to better identify those patients who may have traveled from high-risk areas and were exhibiting symptoms that would require frontline first responders to don the appropriate PPE. In late February and early March, Dr. Casey and the chief administrative officers from the city of Richmond and the counties of Henrico, Hanover, and Goochland agreed to collaborate regionally on preparedness and response to the impending crisis. The CAOs brought together the region's public health directors, the fire and EMS chiefs, and emergency management staff to initiate the planning efforts and to establish a unified command structure. The Central Virginia Incident Management Team, a team formed and led by Chesterfield Fire and EMS, was tasked with coordinating regional efforts. On March 12th, the governor declared a state of emergency for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and on March 13th, the chairs of the boards of supervisors and the mayor of Richmond came together along with their CAOs, school superintendents, public health, and EMS leaders at a joint press conference to announce the declaration of local emergencies and to outline steps that would be taken to protect our collective citizens. Over the successive weekend, county leadership executed plans to transform the footing of our local government apparatus to meet the likely challenges head on and develop contingency plans to comply with public health protective measures, yet still provide essential and many other services to our citizens. The county's Emergency Operations Center, or EOC, was fully activated on March 16th 
and consists of a team of 200 county, county employees representing 25 county departments and our constitutional office, officers who are all continuously working to coordinate the county's emergency response and recovery efforts from the direct effects of this crisis. Because of the need to maintain appropriate distance and not risk virus spread among county leaders and county staff, the EOC is being cut, conducted virtually. The charge to our EOC team is that this crisis will be unlike any other in our lifetime, requiring innovative thinking and flexible execution of activities focused on protecting life and minimizing effects on the community. As you know, the county government has moved to a newly developed operating status called open with reduced operations and schools have closed for the remainder of the school year. While it has been necessary to close some county facilities such as recreation centers, senior centers, libraries, and certain amenities at our park, my message to our business community and our citizens is that Chesterfield County government remains open for business. Our public safety and other essential services are always provided regardless of circumstances, and through the ingenuity of our county employees, many more county services are being delivered, albeit in different ways. A multitude of human services are still being provided to those in need. Permits and inspections are still being performed each day. Connectivity is being maintained with our seniors and those in the community who are disadvantaged, and the school system has provided food to thousands of students in need. We continue to redeploy county employees where needed to provide support to those departments who are on the front lines in dealing with the immediate effects of the crisis and to prepare for a likely increase in human services needs in the weeks and months to come. Moreover, we have established a call center during the week to answer questions citizens may have about county government operations and services and to capture any unmet, unmet needs that may arise. Next slide, please. The members of our EOC team are currently focused on five primary areas. First, public safety, which includes responding to emergencies, transporting patients to hospitals, and preparing to avoid system overload. Second, human services, instituting recommended community protective measures and serving the elderly and others who may be in need. Third, infrastructure, expanding the county's technology systems to accommodate remote networking and ensure that county facilities are kept clean to minimize virus spread. Fourth, finance and administration, ordering and stocking supplies and tracking expenditures for possible further reimbursement through state and federal governments. And finally, continuity of operations, planning to sustain county operations should multiple county employees become exposed or become infected by the virus. In addition to coordinating the county's response, segments of the EOC staff are responsible for maintaining situational awareness, advising on safety and risk management issues, serving in liaison with our hospitals and business community, and providing timely and reliable information to our citizens. Next slide. It has been said that necessity is the mother of innovation. I'm so proud of the dedicated efforts of our county employees who have developed and executed innovative ways to sustain government operations, to meet the county's internal logistics needs, and continue government services during these most trying times. While it's not possible in the time we have this evening to recognize every single way in which our workforce has overcome obstacles in serving others, let me share with you some good examples. Now, as you know, all departments have needed to find ways to practice social distancing, and so uh, we have included, in many cases, rotating work schedules and the expansive use of teleworking, teleconferencing, and electronic, electronic document sharing. All departments have developed plans for continued operations in the event of increased absences should our workforce become exposed or fall ill. In addition, many departments have redeployed staff to address urgent issues and to prepare for the varied ways in which we may have to serve those in need in the coming weeks and months. Other examples of innovative approaches for delivering services include our employee medical center and mental health support services, handling sick visits and counseling services over the phone, our general services department obtaining bulk quantities of hand sanitizer and repackaging the product in small discarded water bottles for distribution throughout the county. Our Citizen Information and Resources and Juvenile Detention Center joining forces in reaching out to our senior population and sending cards and making phone calls to those who are socially isolated. Our Parks and Recreation Department and Cooperative Extension Service providing virtual programming to our citizens through social media. Our Social Services Department streamlining benefit application processes, uh, placing them online or conducting them over the phone 
and identify empl employers who may be hiring and referring those who, have may, who have, may have lost their job. Our libraries offering curbside pickup for materials. Our procurement department conducting online virtual bid openings. Our utilities department lab staff making cleaning supplies for materials in the lab. Our building inspections department establishing a permit drop-off and pickup station outside the CD building and dispatching inspectors directly from their homes to job sites. Our economic development department staying in close touch with businesses and industries in the county and finding creative ways in which to support those businesses that may be struggling. And our communications and media department and expanding the use of social media for communicating directly with our citizens. And there are just many more examples of the innovation demonstrated by our county employees and perhaps we will be able to provide you with a more comprehensive list in the future. Uh, I would also be remiss if I, done, if I did not thank the countless citizens and businesses who have volunteered to assist others in their time of need. I know this community is strong and I know that we will get through this event and be even stronger together in the future. Next slide please. In closing, in addition to the contact information that Dr. Samuel has provided, citizens who have questions about county operations and services during our local state of emergency should refer to the county's website or Facebook page. If they have difficulty of, uh, contacting an individual county department, they can contact our EOC call center at 804-751-2362. Madam Chair, there are two items on your agenda this evening that needs the board's attention in accordance with state code. Uh, the first is the consent uh, of the board for the local state of emergency as declared by the county administrator in his role as the director of emergency management. And second, uh, the consent of the county administrator's appointment of an emergency management coordinator. Uh, to that end, I am pleased to introduce to you Ms. Jess Robinson, who is serving as our interim emergency uh, uh, management coordinator, and I'll ask her to stand. There she is. I know you've been talking to her over the phone, but I wanted to bring her in person to, uh, to meet you directly. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have about our presentation this evening. Well, thank you, Chief, and welcome, Jess. Um, I feel like we do all know you. Um, we have all been rotating through, participating in the fabulous calls that you have been basically um, pulling. You have commanded the team so well and stepped in. Um, and so thank you. Thank you for all the hard work you're doing. But it really is, um, it, it seemed seamless, didn't it, Chief? She um, makes it she, easy. She really, <laughs> she really made she it did easy. a great job. I, I also would be remiss if I didn't point out that that picture, um, when we all stood together just 12 days ago, would not be the same positioning we would be standing in today, just 12 days later. We, the social distancing um, messaging had not been heard at that point in time, so I think it's really important that our folks understand that all of that communication and collaboration is still happening virtually with all of our neighboring regions and, um, and all of those departments and all of those folks, um, but we would not be standing in the same position, <laughs> holding that same press conference or having the same conversations. And we're hoping that our citizens hear that same messaging as is displayed on this day as tonight. So um, thank you, fellow board members. Anybody have any questions or comments for the chief? No, thank you, chief.